Neil deGrasse Tyson, may I have your attention please? You know everything about the universe, stars, comets, planets, galaxies. You know it all. But when it comes to basic aerodynamics, I'm sorry to say it, but in your head there is a black hole. And besides, my shirt is cooler than yours. Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Munger Nordahl, I am an ALN captain and instructor. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist, writer and science communicator. He studied at Harvard University, the University of Texas, and he got his PhD at Columbia University. Tyson served on a 2001 government commission on the future of the US airspace industry and on the 2004 Moon, Mars and Beyond Commission. He was awarded the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal. Since 2009, Tyson has hosted Star Talk, a weekly podcast. With nearly 3 million subscribers on YouTube, it is very popular. Not only because of Tyson, but also because of co-host Shaq Nice, who makes it even more entertaining. When I found Tyson's podcast about how airplanes fly, I was excited because Neil deGrasse Tyson is reaching out to many people. Finally, I thought, here is a podcast that will debunk the most common misconceptions about lift. But I was wrong. As you can read on the website of NASA, quote, there are many explanations for the generation of lift found in encyclopedias, in basic physics textbooks, and on websites. Unfortunately, many of the explanations are misleading and incorrect. Mr. Tyson, you have been fooled. <laughs> All right, so uh, so the top part is curved, okay, and the bottom is, uh, it's typically flat, okay? So you have a pocket of air that the moving wing is passing through, and the air wants to stay as one parcel. It wants to, okay? Okay. So as you do this, the air on top to go that bigger distance has to travel faster, to keep up with the air on the bottom so that when it reconnects, it's the same parcel. Gotcha. All right. So you have forced the air to move faster on the top than on the bottom. And fast moving air has lower pressure. And I've done this before. It is correct that fast moving air has lower static pressure. And it is correct that low static air pressure over the wing results in lift. But this does not happen because air particles separated at the front of the wing are forced to meet behind the wing at the same time. This is called the equal transit time hypothesis. But this is a wrong application of Bernoulli's principle, which says that within a horizontal flow of a fluid, points of higher fluid speed will have less static pressure than points of slower fluid speed. This works well in a Venturi, but the wing divides the airflow into two individual airflows, and that changes everything. Think about it. How can two air particles separated at the front of a wing know where the other air particle is? This is a video produced by Holger Babinski, professor of aerodynamics at the University of Cambridge. It's often said that lift on a wing is generated because the flow moving over the top surface has a longer distance to travel and therefore needs to go faster. This common explanation is actually wrong. This video shows that the air on the top does move faster, but it doesn't reach the end of the wing at the same time as the air along the bottom. Here we use smoke to visualize the streamlines around an airfoil. We can pause the smoke by briefly interrupting the supply. This gives us lines that travel through the flow as we can see here. And if we now slow the video down, you can follow those lines and that gives you an idea of how fast the flow is in different parts of the airflow. Here you can see it speed up as it approaches the airfoil and it moves faster over the top compared to the bottom. You can see that it reaches the end on the upper surface much earlier than it does on the lower surface. In fact, by the time it reaches the end on the lower surface, the flow has already gone a long way past on the upper surface. This shows very clearly that the flow doesn't take the same amount of time to reach the end of the wing. The equal transit time hypothesis is hereby debunked beyond doubt. So how can we explain lift then? According to NASA, quote, lift occurs when a moving flow of gas is turned by a solid object. 
The flow is turned in one direction and the lift is generated in the opposite direction, according to Newton's third law of action and reaction. This is the easiest way to explain lift. But this doesn't mean we shall throw Bernoulli out the window. For example, Bernoulli's equation can be used to calculate the velocity of an airstream when you know the static pressure. It is also useful to visualize the pressure distribution above and below the wing. It is not Bernoulli or Newton. Both are correct. Bernoulli through the preservation of energy. Newton through the preservation of momentum. The reason why air accelerates over the wing is the curved path the air is forced to follow around the wing, and especially the leading edge at high angle of attack. The angle of attack is the angle between the airflow and the cord of the wing. A change in direction requires a force, and this is where Newton's second law of motion comes into play. And behold, Newton's second law can be rearranged into Bernoulli's equation. You can freeze the video and read the text for yourself. I have also made a few videos about lift, where this is explained in more detail, and you will find links in the description below. Now, back to Tyson and Nice. Okay, so, on the runway, where you're ready to take off. Right. And the plane accelerates. The pressure difference between the top and the bottom is becoming greater and greater and greater. And the plane saying, I'm ready to do this, okay? But you don't want to rely only on that. You want to make sure this happens. So, what? The, by the way, it continues to accelerate through this. What the pilots do is they, they, in, they up the flaps on the tail wings, okay? Right. What does that do? That creates extra pressure to push the tail down, pivoting the nose upwards. Uh -huh. When the nose goes upwards, the upward pressure on the wings is no longer just this Bernoulli effect. Bernoulli is the guy who first uh, uh, decoded this phenomenon. It's not only that, the wing is now pitched upward towards the moving air. Right. It's pitched upward. So air is flying straight into the wing that's going to also add to the Bernoulli effect and that plane is going to pop. That's why it doesn't slowly gain altitude. That plane changes its angle to the air and it flies. When the aircraft's nose is rotated up, the angle of attack is increased. As the angle of attack increases, the static air pressure over the wing decreases, while the pressure under the wing remains near constant. The pressure difference between the upper and lower surfaces of the wing is lift, and when the lift is greater than the weight of the aircraft, it will climb. The idea that lift is created by air hitting the under surface of the wing is flawed. Many people compare it with holding the hand out of the window of a car and feeling the lifting force. But most of this force is drag. A wing is designed to produce maximum lift with minimum drag. And that means the air must flow around the wing and not hit it like a sledgehammer. As NASA says it, quote, Neglecting the upper surfaces part in turning the flow leads to an incorrect theory of lift. This illustration is from the book Aerodynamics by L.J. Clancy. It shows the pressure distribution around the wing at different angle of attack. The green area above the wing is low pressure. The blue area below the wing is high pressure. At plus 2 degrees, the underside and overside of the wing contributes equally to lift, 50% each. When the angle of attack increases, the overside of the wing produces more and more of total lift. And at 15 degrees, it is close to maximum. When the angle of attack increases further, the airflow over the wing becomes turbulent and the lift decreases rapidly. This is stall. And this is what you experience when you hold your hand out a car window. So, every plane, if it has the option, is going to take off into the wind. Aha! Because what matters is not the speed relative to the ground. 
because a tailwind would give you high speed relative to the ground. But once you're airborne, you want to stay there. And so what matters is the speed over your wings that the air has. And so you take, that's why every airport and aircraft carriers have at least two runways at an angle to each other so that when the wind direction switches, they can change which runway you're using so that you will always take off into the wind. Nice. Always. And the two, the I forgot what the, is it 45 or 30 degree angle? It's not, it's not at a 90 degree angle to each other. Okay. No, no, because if you do, if you do the math and the geometry on this, you want it to be about at 30 degree angle because then all combinations, what you do is you, if you, if the wind changes direction, then you just take off in the opposite direction of the, of the, all right. And right. You, it turns out many solutions are solved just by having two runways at that angle. And that's why aircraft carriers, you will see, um, just take a look at their shape. But the World War II class aircraft carriers, you could, they had two angles you could land on their right. deck. Right, yeah, uh, yeah. On it. And if you're going to land from the direction you're coming, they would turn around the aircraft carrier so that you're coming in against the wind. So, most airports have only one runway or two parallel runways. And regarding aircraft carriers, I will come back to them soon. To allow for an aircraft to take off from an airport with two runways with maximum headwind component, the runway should not cross each other with 30 degrees, but 90 degrees. This ensures maximum headwind component. For example, an airport has two runways. Runway 36 is oriented towards 360 degrees north, and runway 03 towards 030 degrees. If the wind is 20 knots from 90 degrees, runway 36 will have pure crosswind, and for runway 03, the wind will be offset 60 degrees, which means the headwind component is 10 knots. Then, we have an airport where the runways are crossing each other with 90 degrees, runway 36 and 09. If the wind is 20 knots from uh, 90 degrees, the heading component on runway uh, 09 is uh, 20 knots. A worst case scenario will be the wind from uh, 45 degrees, giving a heading component of 40 knots for both runways. Then we have the aircraft carriers. They always steer into the wind when aircraft are taking off and landing. Neil deGrasse Tyson, since you are living in New York, I'm sure you have visited Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. USS Intrepid was commissioned in 1943 and decommissioned in 1974. In the hangar, you will see two models of the aircraft carrier. One model shows the initial configuration with a straight deck. And this was normal during World War II. But it had a major flaw. Before takeoff, aircraft were parked at the aft section of the deck and the rest served as a runway. No problem with that. When the aircraft were returning, they had to catch one of several wires stretched across the deck with a tail hook. After landing, the aircraft will taxi to the forward part of the deck. And a barrier was erected to protect the parked aircraft from landing aircraft that missed the wires. But this arrangement was not perfect. When an aircraft hit the barrier, it could receive so much damage that it may have to be scrapped or dumped overboard. This problem increased with the introduction of jet-powered aircraft, which had higher landing speed, and therefore less margin for error. The solution came with the introduction of the angled flight deck. USS Intrepid received this modification in the middle of the 1950s. All aircraft carriers in the US Navy have this arrangement today. This allows for landing aircraft to go around if they miss the wires. Simple as that. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I challenge you to make a new video about lift where you got those things right. For inspiration, I recommend the following mentors. Holger Babinski, Professor of Aerodynamics, University of Cambridge. 
Doug McLean, retired technical fellow at Boeing, and Christoph Fidowski, professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. If you love your mother, click like, share and all that. Or you will find a spider in your bed tonight. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy learning!